Uh, well, thank you, Tim. Let me start out by, since I'm the last speaker, to thank Tim for this wonderful workshop in Luca. And I'd like to give them a big round of applause. Well, I certainly very much enjoyed this, this workshop and learned many things. Uh, so today I want to tell you this last thing. Uh, what a natural algorithm, so I have an answer. So algorithms from nature, that I will take questions now. <laughs> and uh, uh, here there's a reception, we, you know, we can go. Okay, so, all right, I knew you would like some more. So, so classical algorithms would, would be like page rank, and then uh, a natural algorithm would be like uh, bird flo uh, flocking. So what's the difference? Uh, page rank, about 100 designers, 10 years, more or less. And uh, these would be 1,000 trillion designers, 100 million years. So it's a different kind of algorithm. In, in particular, these algorithms are really bug-free, which is a concept we humans don't really understand. Because natural selection is really the ultimate software optimizer. Uh, I mean, here you've got more than one algorithm, actually, uh, at work. Uh, this is a famous picture, a termite thing, lungs. Uh, this is bird flocking, I'll get to this. Now, when you look at this, and you see people who've worked on this, they come mostly from two groups of applied mathematics and physics. One is um, dynamics, Poincaré, from dynamical systems theory, work starting from the uh, end-body problem. From, uh, and uh, Boltzmann, father of statistical, statistical physics, me, uh, mechanics, two different approaches. Uh, so, so this is really the textbook example of a dynamical system, just one equation, you just iterate. And you've got the famous bifurcation diagram, which is a very, very complex system. Um, and this would be also the simplest, maybe, icing model of stati statistical physics. Uh, all these, those techniques, not just these two examples, but the entire fields I claim are insufficient to understand, say, bird flocking or natural algorithms in general. So my uh, call to arms is that we have to add algorithms to this picture if we want to make f further progress. Um, now, let me, be, uh, before I get into examples, tell you uh, what are the differences. Now, natural algorithms are just dynamical systems, after all. So, so, so why are they really different from the others, and why can't you use all techniques uh, to do that? Well, there's a number of reasons. First of all, there's no sort of agency. Like, these algorithms tend to have lots of different agents, and, and they're autonomous. They decide to do their own thing when they want. Uh, they are different kind of agents. They communicate a lot. Communication is absolutely crucial, and the medium of communication is crucial. They have diversity of goals. Uh, they don't all want to do the same thing. Whereas in the gas, particles pretty much all want to, to do the same thing. Uh, but the most important is, for lack of a better word, what I call expressive complexity, that their algorithms can be expressively complex. So there's a different meaning of the word uh, complexity here, which is, to me, the main reason why. It's really a question of language. These algorithms are just too, too long to explain, and there's just too... Um, too many things happen in bizarre order, and so they don't have these nice symmetries that mathematics is so, is so good at. Now, another thing is natural algorithms are not just standard algorithms. They're different in some, in some subtle ways. Uh, well, first of all, they don't come written down, because we don't get to write them down. And uh, birds do not have the little algorithm written on their DNA, although maybe they do. We don't know. Uh, also, they run forever which analytically is very important because I, mean, I got to appreciate that when an algorithm runs forever, not because it's a bug caught in the loop, because that's the nature of the thing, uh, to understand it is a very different ball game. Otherwise, they have lots of similarity. This is a very classical algorithm for signal processing. Does something, who cares? The point is that this is all, almost the same algorithm, except this, this is for P53, the famous protein that keeps us from getting cancer. And uh, so biologists and so on, they just try to write these circuits. They don't call them algorithms, but that's really what they are. And um, so f from my work, I'll take three examples, uh, bird flocking, sync, and opinion dynamics. Let me start with the last one, um, um, which I think carries probably, to me, the most important message of what I want to say. So opinion dynamics is a neat problem framework which came outside of computer science. Uh, came from economics and philosophy and uh, control theory. So there's this famous model which goes like this. So here's a simplified version in one dimension. You could do this in, in higher dimensions. So on the politi political spectrum, you can be on the left, you can be on the right. 
And uh, there's, a, there's a number that tells you how far you are. And, and now there's the basic philosophy that we are influenced by like-minded people. We're not influenced by people who are way, way out of our range of, of comfort, but we're very influenced by our friends. If I talk to Dan, I'll be influenced by what he has to say because I trust his, uh, his judgment. So if we defer, I might come a little bit toward him or something. And so, um, so the model says that everybody is going to have some interval of influence of confidence. and. Uh, and simply will move to the mass center of, so you move to the mass center of your neighbors. And these neighbors are defined by this little, uh, so there's a rule. Everybody has a rule. And the rule does not need to be the same. We don't have to have the same, uh, the same rule. So everybody does that. That's one step. So these are discrete. So it's continuous motion, you know, the positions, but the time is discrete. Uh, it's exactly the opposite of quantum mechanics. So. Uh, you have this little diagram, this bifurcation diagram that actually tells you usually there are clusters and here you end up having two opinions. Uh, somewhere left of center and right of center and this is, so there are lots of conjectures about why you get this picture. I'm sorry? That's time. Uh, yeah, yeah, sorry, time is going up here, yes. Um, so the results I want to talk about is, the first one is not mine. This was known before that each agent has the same rule. The system always converges. Uh, I give some bounds. I, I build this analytical framework, which allows you to actually uh, give bounds. And um, but what, what I showed also is yeah. What is converging mean? Yeah, I'll get to that. I will tell you what it is. Uh, if not, if each agent has different rules, this is really the interesting part. Then the system is almost surely asymptotically periodic, but it can be chaotic. So perturbations are required, okay? You have to perturb the system a little bit, otherwise you're in trouble. And the period can be exponential. Now, when I tell my friends in sociology the exponential thing, they're fascinated because for them, he, 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 and the philosophers, it tells them the following thing that, you know, you throughout your life, you talk to people and your political opinion changes. Uh, you, you think you are evolving. You're just becoming more, more mature and you just listen to people and you change your opinion. But in fact, these results show this is not true at all. You're caught on a wheel. You're in this periodic thing, and it's just, but it's exponential. You don't even know that. <laughs> you, you don't even realize because by the time you're back to where you were, you've forgotten about it. And so this is the sort of like negation of free will, uh, if you will. It's very scary. Chaotic is surprising if you're, for a technical standpoint, the, the, this system should not be chaotic. Uh, for, for one thing, all your Yapunov exponents, if you, you know what these are, are non-positive, which right there really tells you this is very unlikely to be chaotic, but they are. Uh, they can be chaotic, so one has to be very careful about this. Chaotic, there are several definitions of chaotic. Chaotic in the strongest sense of the word. In other words, it can be as bad as you can imagine. So anyway, uh, this is what will happen. Things will just go, 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 and then they will continue forever. Everybody goes into, at some, now these are, this is asymptotically periodic. Nobody will lock into perfectly a period. There's a finite number of orbits, and every other orbit is attracted to one of them and get closer and closer, exponentially closer to one of them. But some of them will not move, so they have uh, period one. Uh, this has to happen, otherwise they all converge. They will have to have some people who eventually never change their mind. And the others will have to, because you can only orbit within the convex hull of some stable things. It's just a fact of life. What? What's the rule, the rule then? The, the rule? I just show, uh, the, so this is a two-dimensional version of the same rule that I show that you take some neighborhood and then we can argue about the actual shape of the circle or square, and these are just technical things, but roughly that's what's happening. So now, analytically, if you want to think of this, it's very important to understand that and this is a big difference with the traditional uh, analysis of algorithms. You have to think as things acting in phase space. And, and this really is, a, is something people in dynamical systems are very, very familiar with, but we don't do that. So let me explain what I mean by this. So, um, look, let's go back to the one-dimensional model. So I have n agents, so n points. So think of this uh, of a point in n dimension. So this is a point in n dimensions. And uh, 
And all these uh, different rules, what they end up doing is partitioning space to a bunch of cells within which you have the same stochastic matrix that kicks in. As long as you are in this thing, you have the same averaging rule that kicks in. And so you have these discontinuities, and that's what makes it interesting. And now when you when the system acts on the initial position, what happens is that this guy will move somewhere. And now it moves, and then it moves somewhere else. And then it moves. And every time it moves, it applies this matrix to, to go to the next. And this goes on forever. And the question is, we know what happens to it. Um, so to follow the trajectory, the orbit of one point, that's the way we think in algorithms. But this will get you nowhere. You can stare at this for, for six months, for six years. That will be, you cannot prove it's periodic by just looking at, at this picture or looking at this framework. You have to think holistically. And before I get to this, let me just say at least some intuition why uh, between chaotic and periodic, there's a huge range. But there's some basic intuition that I think helps people who work in this field. Which is the following. So I'm not going to give you a theorem here. It's a more a rule of thumb that if you take the pre-images of these discontinuities, so the, the discontinuities between these stochastic matrices, take the pre-images of this, okay, where can they come from? And just try drawing this and look, see what it looks like. Now, if it looks like this and eventually it becomes dense, chances are it's going to be chaotic. I, this is not a theorem, okay, but chances are uh, it's going to be chaotic. On the other hand, if those guys, this is an infinite set of lines here, but if they tend to cluster around a smaller number, of, like spaghetti that tend to have just some directions, uh, then chances are it will be periodic. Now, in this particular case, that's what happens with measure one. It, it's stronger than measure one. I mean, it's uh, where it does not happen is a Cantor set, so it's not just measure zero, it's much less than that. I mean, Rationals are measure zero, but they're much bigger than a kind of set. So, um, so that's what they form. So it's a very rare event, but uh, still, when analytically, that rare event is what drives the entire work. You see, so you cannot say, oh, "I'll just ignore it," but the actual proof really has to focus on that because that is where the nightmare can happen. Um, yeah. Questions. Okay, so yep. you're taking pre-images yes. dependent on using discrete time. Yes. So if you used continuous time, we wouldn't have that. Is, can I conversely assume with continuous time you won't get to no, well, no, you would still have the issue of what you do when somebody falls uh, you know, straight, uh, straight uh, on the uh, on the thing. So, so, so yeah, you will have a, you will have a flow that will bifurcate gently. Yes. Whereas here, it's it's kind of, but so th there are continuous versions of all of these things, and and they always end up more or less with the same results. And uh, uh, but um, uh, so um, I guess I'm rushing things a little, little bit because I. I want to cover maybe too many things, and so I apologize if you think I'm just rushing through this. Um, but I think so far things are pretty simple, right? So, so an interesting notion is what's called a coding. You know, you do what's called symbolic dynamics, where you try to get something discrete out of this continuum. And so, in particular, it's, these regions are labeled, so you can form a language. It's the language of possible orbits with the words. So you get these words by simply following where you get. So you get A, D. And then you get C, then you get uh, E, then you get D, then you get something like F. You see what I'm, well, I'm just writing this word by just following the trajectory of this guy. And, just, yeah, and this goes on forever. Okay? And maybe it'll become periodic at some point. I, I don't know. Maybe not. I mean, who, who knows? Maybe I get Macbeth. You know? I, I don't know. And, uh, and so I can encode this in a tree. This is the coding tree, and it's an infinite tree, and it defines a language. Okay, fine. So, so this, this tree m must be useful because this tree is going to tell me really lots of things that happens. But, but this tree is only part of the story. Uh, you cannot just do symbolic dynamics. You actually have to respect the geometry. And now this tree really has a geometric incarnation. Think about it. Um, so this is the tree, and I have retraced the path which corresponded to this, to this word here. So, so why is this a geometric entity? Well, think of this as time here, and think of slices. So these are discrete times. So you, you, you would have slices, and if you take a slice for a fixed time, you get all of phase space, 
and there will be subdivisions. And this will be these tubes as they cut across. Let's take a tree and just slice it, and every slice will tell you what happens. Now this tree, you understand, this tree as a geometric object is, contains everything. I mean, it's like the partition functions. It has everything. There's not a single fact about the dynamical system that's not encoded in this tree. If you understand this geometric object, the geometry matters, you understand everything about it. See, we almost never do this in computer science. I, like, we almost never think of some sad solver and just think of the geometry of all possibilities on all possible and where it goes. Maybe it's for lower bounds sometimes, actually, we have to think like this. But this is not something we do routinely, and this is for upper bounds here. But here you have to do it. So let me not get into why you have to do it. But anyway, th this is a very complex object. This, this itself will be a Cantor set, by the way. It'd be like a fractal, you know, it'll go into. But there's certain things you have to know about it in, if you want to prove that it's chaotic or it's periodic. So there's certain parameters. Some, I think, obviously are important. For example, why is the branching? How fast does it branch out? So that's what's called the word entropy that will measure that. It's roughly the entropy of that language, okay, that we have. So it's a discrete quantity. But the other one is geometric, is the thinning rate. These tubes will thin out. They will get thinner and thinner or as they go down. Just like trees outside on the campus here, the things get thinner. And, and you want to know how quickly that happens. How, this is a convergence rate, okay? And so, um, now, why they thin down? There's a very basic principle that you have to think of this system as a sort of dissipative thing where, where all the eigenvalues are less than one, and so, or, or at most one, actually, there can be one, unfortunately. But, but it, it's helpful, or at least I find it very helpful, to have a physical analogy with the springs. But this thing are like, like this thing has springs, and it oscillates, and uh, these springs are one way, so it's hard to think of this, because it, this could be an un, a directed graph, so you have to think of a, a spring that acts only on one on one side, so it violates Newton and so on. But, but at least I, I think in your mind you can think of this. And that's the reason why things are uh, thinned down. The branching is pretty obvious. I mean, think of this not as a point, but take a little ball and just follow it. And if you're not lucky, this, this is going to hit in the middle, so this will split. And then this will split. And, and you can hope this is not going to happen too often. <laughs> and uh, so, I, anyway, so you have the entropy that you'd like to get a hold on, and then you have, you've got this thinning thing that you want to get a hold on. So you, you need tools to do that. These are very complicated uh, objects. And so now, so this is the part where I think uh, algorithms play a big role. So here's the way I'm going to do it. I'm going to write an arithmetic expression that generates this tree entirely with the whole geometry. And this arithmetic expression will be written in a special language, I will describe briefly just now. So I will invent some kind of language with primitives and there will be arithmetic expressions. The variables will be simple coding trees. There are some special cases that I can do directly. For example, if you have two agents, that's very, if one agent is even easier. But, but there's some other cases that actually are easy, that you can simply do directly. So this will be your primitive and then you will build arithmetic expressions which are constructions like Lego toys that you just built on top of that, okay? Now these operations, I won't go into this, but there are two major kinds. There are sort of tensor product kinds, okay? There's direct sum and direct product. And then there are renormalization group types. So in statistical mechanics, renormalization is one of the biggest success story of the second half of the 20th century. And, um, and that's really a sort of scaling technique that's extremely powerful. And so, so this is really the inspiration for this, which is basically how you can recursively cut down this into subproblems and, and find a way of plugging in subproblems together. And uh, so, so, so you have all these five operations, and then, for example, this is possibly a, a, an expression, and this will generate some kind of tree. Now, there are two questions with this. One is, how do we find this expression? And number two is, why are we doing this? Um, let me answer the last question first. Well, we're doing this, well, there's a good reason for doing this. It's because once I have the arithmetic expression, I can look at it, uh, I can just scan it and just like parse it, you know, and then I can make inferences because I have a dictionary and the dictionary tells me for each operation its effect 
on the word entropy and on the thinning rate. So if you're combining, you know, think of these operations as combining trees together in various ways. And it tells me that if I know everything about Dan's tree, I know everything about Yuri's tree, and you guys get combined in some tensor product, I will know something about the results. So that's why this arithmetic expression is very useful. It's extremely important. But the most interesting part is this. How do we find this arithmetic expression? So see, this is not a question where you just sit down, look at the system, and just write down this, what you think is right. No, you cannot do this. You need a, you need a compiler to do that. You see, this is not something uh, that... Um, it, it, it's compiled by a flow algorithm. And here's what I mean. That, now let's go back to the original, the original uh, scenario. So we talk to each other and we exchange information. And then this information influences us. Now, let's distinguish two di uh, different things with information. One is semantic and the other is syntactical. Syntactical is, is, is like Google, is who gets to be influenced by me if I talk to Dan and then talk to Yuri. So we, we can kind of monitor the spreading of the syntactical spreading of, of information. The second part is semantic, is what do you do with it? Where do you add it? Do you average it? Do you, I don't know what you actually do with it. Okay, so, so the flow algorithm is only syntactical. It's like Google, if you will. So let me give you a quick uh, summary of the way it would work. I would pick like a random agent like me. And then I would see what happens to me. So maybe I sh So if I talk to Dan, here's what will have the convention, okay, just as an image. I have wet hands and, and everybody has dry hands. Okay, so when I talk to Dan, I, I shake his hand. This is just part of the protocol. We belong to some secret society. So I, I, I shake his hand, and now his hand is wet. When he talks to Uri, now Uri's hand becomes wet. So wetness spreads out. And, and now I can ask the question, suppose at some point everybody gets wet. Well, we, if that happens, maybe it won't happen, but if that happens, let me stop that right there and dry everybody's hand. And then let's start again. Okay, or it could be that at some point only this group gets wet, and this other group will never get wet. Well, you can wait infinity; they will never, because there's a cut, and the cut is over time. It's not just a cut in the graph; it's, it's over time. In which case, I can recursively break things into separate things. Even though one has to be careful, communication. It means that if they don't get wet. It means communication does not go from here to here. But communication could be from there to there. So if they become wet, they could spread their wetness to us, but not the other way around. So, so this water has to have di uh, different color. Maybe my color is going to be red, and Uri's color is going to be green, and yours is going to be yellow, so that we know who is spreading what. So that algorithm is a flow algorithm that basically monitors these magic times. All these times when everybody at some point gets to be influenced by me. What is the first time that happens? And all these times are used, are compiled into the arithmetic expression. Okay? So, I mean, so this is the case where really the entire analysis relies on an actual, you know, like a, it's, it's not a max flow algorithm, but it's an algorithm of that kind where you have things go around and monitor, you know, how information goes. So it's a proof that's really algorithmic, which is, I guess, the point of my, of my talk uh, to some extent. Let me check the time because, um, yeah, so, so, so that, 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 that was opinion dynamics, yeah. So how much uh, would the picture change in some, let's say, the spirit of this workshop, smooth analysis if each operation happens with some noise? Yes, so I see, so, <coughs> So there's worst case, and then we go beyond worst case. So that would be average, where you take some kind of averaging and you still get a number. Then there's smoothness, where you pick anybody, even adversarially, and then you just go around, okay? In here, you need to go beyond that, because you need to make topological statement about the entire, this geometric body that is built by the action of the system over the entire phase space. The, that thing, you have to make topological statement about it. And so if you simply do some smooth thing on a given, so basically you have a, a thick in orbit, that alone will not tell you anything to prove the, to prove the theorem. You have, it has to be entirely holistic. And, and I know we're not used to this because in fact, automata, 
periodicity is kind of trivial. It's a pumping lemma thing. It's, it's discrete, so at some point you hit yourself again, and that's it, you're periodic. But here it's continuous, so things are very subtle. You could get closer and closer and closer, and at some point you guys happen to fork out because you're unlucky. So that's why you need a completely global view of things, or at least, at least that's the way I convince myself. Okay, maybe you, you can find it differently. Okay, sync. So this work is in reverse chronological order, actually, but uh, uh, sync is. Um, so if you you know physics 101 or something, maybe you've seen this experiment. I have two cans of Coke, although I think it works with Pepsi too. But uh, and uh, so you have two metronomes, and they start in random phases. The phases are not the same; they're not synchronized. But if you wait long enough, not very long, then they will become perfectly synchronized. Now it's important. This would be wood, and this would be. If you hold it with your hands, this is not going to work. They will not synchronize. So, so, so they have to be on some kind of like a musical instrument, you know, like this. It's boring. It's because they talk to each other. And they have to be able to talk to each other. Now, this is ancient. I mean, this was discovered and understood hundreds of years ago. There's, there's no mystery here. But the point is, so these, these are three coupled oscillators. And they talk through a network. And the network is a complete graph, but there are weights. I mean, obviously, there's more communication between these two guys than between these things. So there's a little graph, which, is, which never changes. And anyway, that's what happens. Now, this uh, composer, this uh, late composer, uh, Hungarian composer Ligeti, had a, uh, you can check this on YouTube. It's a concerto for metronomes. He, he has a uh, hundred of them. And they go, and since they're synchronized because of this theory, uh, then uh, the music, well, it's not music, it's noise, but, 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 but the noise would be kind of interesting. You should check it out. And um, anyway, and um, so there the communication network is more complicated, but it's fixed. Now, I'm interested in networks that change, change all the time, that change over time. And so, now this is a good example. Uh, this is ancient, so, so this is a firefly. And there's this amazing uh, story, uh, Sir Francis Drake. Now, this guy lived a long time ago, like 16th century. He just wrote, went around the world, and he went to um, uh, near, uh, th this was near Thailand. And he reported in his diary and then he, in his letters something totally amazing. He said, uh, I was uh, standing there on the hill, and then I saw this thing. There's a river, and I saw over two or three miles. There, it was covered with... Uh, fireflies and they start flashing and very quickly they all flash in unison over miles how, how do they know it it seems inconceivable how can they possibly know that two miles apart they flash exactly in unison how do they do it and um, it was so amazing that nobody believed he, they, they thought he was drunk which was not an absurd inference to make because he was always drunk. <laughs> but you can be drunk and tell the truth. That's uh, it's, uh, the that's thing. So, so there's a very nice model by, this, uh, uh, by several people, but Moho, I think, is the sort of most general, nicest uh, model to capture this sort of uh, situation. So now, this is a very simple model. But every time I've explained it, I've always failed. I've always had the most amazing question. Like, for example, when you say arbitrary, what do you mean? <laughs> you know, it's, a, it's kind of a, so. So let me try it again here, and let's see. Let's see. Let's see if this audience m m measures up. Um, so you have an arbitrary sequence of n graph nodes. It's infinite. Okay, these are undirected. Undirected. Okay, and. If there's an arbitrary embedding of the first one. So, so the first graph is embedded in, in, in some space, some metric space, okay? And so, okay, it, it's arbitrary, arbitrary, okay? And uh, um, now here's what I do. In parallel, I take each node, like this one. So I take one, but I take all of them in parallel. But I, I will explain to you what I do on one, and then you can picture what I do. And here's what I do. I take the neighbors, and then I, I take the convex hull of the neighbors, and I shrink it a tiny bit by a factor of one minus rho. Think of rho as very small, like 1%. But rho is very important. It cannot be zero. And you shrink it just a tiny bit. And then uh, this guy moves anywhere. And I mean anywhere. That's also a word that people have trouble with. Anywhere. Just anywhere. Arbitrary anywhere. And, uh, and you repeat for each node in parallel. That's step one. 
And then you do step two, so that's what happens. Who is <laughs> Sesh, are you blown away by these? Uh... <laughs> okay, good. Uh... <laughs> so now you take your second graph. Remember, you have an infinite sequence of graphs. Take your second graph. It's arbitrary graph. The graphs don't have to be given ahead of time. They could come up. No. They're arbitrary. Number of nodes or not? What? In number of nodes? Yeah, same number of nodes. Same number of nodes. Labeled nodes. Same nodes. Right. Same nodes. Honestly, the, nodes the nodes are labeled and they are the same. So they're like those people in this room. Okay, they are they have an identity. That's uh, and you do the same thing and you repeat and you repeat forever. Again. And on and on and on and on forever. Forever also means like. You know, these uh, universal quantifiers are very difficult. It, it means for all time. And um, so, so just make sure we understand. It's highly non-deterministic. It's for any graph sequence, any initial embedding, and any moves. Okay? And now what happens? And this linear and linear doesn't matter. This always converges. So I, I'll get to your, I'll answer your question. It always converges. And, and the rate can be bounded optimally. Okay? And um, so... Convergence means what? Actually, things might never stop moving. I mean, here they stop moving because my PowerPoint skills don't, don't allow me to, to, to have them move forever. But, but what really happens is they get closer and closer. So convergence means that for any epsilon, you can wait some time, t of epsilon, and then they'll all be within some, some uh, ball of radius epsilon, and they will never move away from that, ever. OK? For any, so that's convergence. Yeah, yeah, you're happy with that. Good. So, if you think dually, you yes. Think all points end up in a ball, or no, 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 no. That would be consensus. It might happen or not, but it, it does not have to be the case. It, it could be this, like there are three clusters. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, Dan has papers actually given all sorts of necessary sufficient conditions to get consensus, and I highly recommend these papers. And uh, but, but here, I don't insist on consensus. I don't care. Convergence will, will always happen anyway, OK? And now, if you think dually, and I, I'll explain later what I mean by that. But if you think dually, this is, this is a random walk over graphs that change all the time. So think of a standard random walk. But now, just imagine that every step, somebody changes the graph, removes some edges, and puts some, and just continues like this. And this goes on infinitely. Can you make statements about it? This is exactly the dual, but it really means it is the same thing. Okay. So in particular, any theory that handles what I'm talking about will have to subsume all of Markov chain theory as a subcase. It, it just has to, because you can simply map any problem this. So, okay, so just so you keep this in mind, in particular, you should be able to rediscover the basic theorems of Markov chain out of this if you're going to go anywhere. So the total S energy will do that. So let me define a function, a generating function, that, that I think is very useful for networks. People in networks maybe should uh, try to see whether they can use this thing. So at any step, you have this graph, OK? And this graph is embedded in space, OK? It lives in some, some space. So there's a distance. So you can look at the distance. Uh, between xi and xj. So here's what you do. Take the L2 distance between uh, the length of the edges. So take the length of the edge, raise it to the power s, so s is a parameter, and just sum that up over all time. And it's, it's as dumb as it gets. You just take the edge, take the length, and you take the power s, and then you just add it up and see what happens, okay, forever. Now. This is not a very promising function. After all, when e, e of 0, when you think about it, e of 0 is the total number of edges, which is going to be most likely infinite. I mean, it does not have to be infinite, but let's face it, most likely it's going to be infinite. Yeah. It's just the sum of all. It, it, the Laplacian, I mean, the uh, quadratic form of the Laplacian would be the particular case s equals 2. And there would be no t here. There would be no sum here. Yeah. So we're taking the Laplacian, but with different powers, and summing over all times. Summing over all times sounds dangerous, uh, because why should this thing converge? Um, now, this follows a power law that's easy to see, so you can always assume that it lives in the unique cube forever. It's a, this is a convex process. It would never expand. Um, 
And I showed this, that for s equals 1, this is the bound. And for s between 0 and 1, this is, now these are the only interesting cases. The interval 0, 1 is really the, the interesting case. Outside of this, it's, it's stupid. Uh, now this is optimal, but this is, I don't know, but I don't think it is. I suspect that this should not be n squared. It should be better than it should get. But, uh, so that's an open question, I think, whether you can improve this. I think, well, I can't, but maybe you should work on it and do it. Um, now from this, from this you can have convergence bounds. For the same, I mean, these are like a, these are like turn-off bounds when you think about it. It's just a generating function, and it just gives you, you know, concentration bounds. And so it's not a surprise that you could get uh, convergence bounds, actually pretty strong convergence bounds, from such something like that. Okay, and then you can apply then to all these applications. Uh, the Firefly thing falls within a, a, a family of systems called uh, Kuramoto sync systems, and so on. Uh, now, to pursue the Markov chain analogy, okay, is there such a thing as a reversible agreement system? Reversible Markov chains are very important and very relevant in practice. And the answer is yes, so I won't define what it is, but you can define one. And sure enough, it's much smaller. So, and that's optimal. So, in particular, the reversible systems have much lower S energy. So, this is the S energy, it's polynomial, and the other is exponential. And from this, you can retrieve the standard mixing rates of pretty much any graph you want. So, so you can retrieve all the, the thing about, for example, what the mixing rate is polynomial for. Ergodic, random process, you know, things like that. Um, I mean, as you should, because there's no miracle. It should have this. Now, if you look at the total S energy as an analytical object, then you can ask some interesting questions. First of all, you can see it's not going to be easy. Because, for example, take the graph with two nodes. The same graph, graph never changes. So it couldn't be simpler than that. But let's say the length is 1 over k. Then you get Riemann zeta function right there. So this is not, you know, this is not going to be the easiest thing. However, you can show, because this is what's called a Dirichlet series, generalized Dirichlet <laughs> series, it has an inverse formula. And in fact, it is a generating function. I mean, for me, a generating function is, a, is an object that allows you to invert. It does not lose information. And this does not lose information. This actually encodes all the lengths of all the edges over all time. You can retrieve all that. Pretty re remarkable, just from this E of S. Um, so it is a lossless encoding. And now you can play around with it. Now, there are some reasons why you might want to look over the complex plane well, what happens. I mean, I was talking with Nati Linio, who suggested this probably it's probably a, a functional equation hiding somewhere there. So I'll briefly say something. So that'll be very quick. Uh, in general, this function does not have an analytic continuation over the whole plane. I mean, there's, there's no way. This is much too arbitrary. However, my conjecture is that if you look at the worst cases, remember the graph sequence is arbitrary. So there's a worst possible sequence that works because it's all compact. So that 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 worst sequence. I so conjecture has analytic continuation and then probably has a functional equation. So I, I prove this for n equals 2, <laughs> which is, okay, so by induction has to be true. Um, so why is the total S energy useful? I, I want to give you some intuition why th this is actually a useful thing. A and it's easy to have simple intuition, I think, for, for what this is doing. So. There's a whole body of literature, in, there are books written on products of, stoch of stochastic matrices. So, you know, a standard uh, random walk on a graph is a product of one. You take powers of, of a fixed matrix. But what if you change these matrices? There are stochastic matrices, but you just, you know. So, so what can you say about those animals? When do they converge? And or when you multiply from the left or from the right, is it, is it the same? Is it different? So there's a whole thing that you can say, OK? Uh, it's a very rich body of literature. but. In my, and maybe Dan will, will contradict me, but, but, but uh, at least my experience is that virtually all the techniques have a, a, a similar thread. They have, they, they have a common thread, and I want, even though there, some of them are very, very different. I mean, it's a very rich body of things. There are many ways you can attack these, um, these animals, but they all have one common thread, which is the following. So that's sort of generalized, I think, uh, what's going on here. Take one such matrix, it's n by n, it's a stochastic matrix. Look at a row and think of this as a point in four space, a point in R4. So there, there it is. 
Now you can do the same thing with the second row and the third row. So, so you get four points. In, okay, in four space. Now you can take the convex hull of that. Okay, take the convex hull of that, uh, and that some points might, might be inside. So you get a, a convex polytope that's associated with the matrix. Okay, and that's P1. Now it's very simple to see. This is completely elementary to see that when you multiply two P1 by P2, there's a third polytope. There's a polytope corresponding to P2, P1. The polytope fits inside this one. It always does. Okay? That's just, that's just a fact of life. By convexity, this will always fit inside. The question is to you know, does it fit snugly or does it fit, you know, tightly, liberal, you know? And so, it seems to me that virtually every approach basically multiplies those things and say, you know, those things are getting smaller because they're Russian dolls. They have to fit. When you take the next product, it has to fit inside the previous one. You may have to rotate it, though, to fit it. But they have to, so these are Russian dolls. And, and we want to show these Russian dolls converge very quickly. How do we do this? So there are many ways. You can say, well, maybe we can measure the volume. Maybe we can measure the diameter and argue that these things shrink. Maybe you can measure all sorts of things. Now, this polytope, you can, you, you, you can have a, an enclosing box. So, some average of these quantities I just mentioned, some weighted things. So, so you have all these different quantities. Uh, some are algebraic, like spectral gas, but others are more geometric, and so on. And, and then just, these are all these sort of Lyapunov functions like animals. We just try to capture how this shrinks. But see, notice these are all local operations. They, they simply tell you from here to here, this is the progress you, you're going to make. These are local statements. So they're very strong. What, what happens is for a long time there's no progress at all. And then there's a lot of progress. You see, this is for every step the following has to happen. It's a very strong, very strong statement. Think when you prove convergence of uh, mixing things for Markov chains. Think about it. Your statement is always from t to t plus 1, here's what must happen. Uh, okay, the convergence is always monotone as a, as, a, as a function of the eigenvalues. So this is too strong. The S energy bypasses this totally. When you fix S, this is a statement about the entire trajectory. This entire shrinking process, this entire function, it in integrates something of that by taking some moment. And you fix S. So S is like a temperature. I mean, you can actually draw the equivalent of the temperature. It's like a partition function, if you know a bit about physical physics. And then you can set the temperature and basically get this kind of moment that will tell you. So what you will do is really pick the, the right S. Just when you look at the of bounds, if you look at the proofs, at some point, there's a parameter there, lambda. And at some point, you fix the lambda. Well, that's the temperature that, that you fix to be, that, that's S here, to be uh, what you think it, uh, it should be. OK, so the, the proof actually is an algorithm. It, it, the proof is very much like uh, uh, th th those, uh, you know, Tartan Slater, potential, credit, amortization. I mean, that, that drives physicists crazy. I mean, I know Bob Tartan say, oh, yo, this all comes from physics, but you should know how much they hate those things, uh, actually. They say, this is a joke. This cannot be your proof. If you have a bank and, and, and piggy banks, I mean, you call this a proof. I mean, these are physicists, physicists who invented the concept of a physics proof, where physics proof is polite English for no proof. <laughs> and uh, so anyway, the third, bird flocking, which is where I got started into this, because I'm totally fascinated by bird flocking. It's just one of those amazing algorithms I've ever seen. So I was sitting in this, at Princeton, there's this guy, Ian Cousin, who was like the world expert on that. And, and he was giving a talk. I was, just, I was just there by accident. And uh, I knew there would be nice pictures like this. So, and he gave this entire talk for an hour, and I thought, this is unbelievable. He, he just gave an algorithms talk. I mean, he never mentioned the word algorithm. But everything on the slides were just algorithms after algorithms after algorithms. And I said, well, this, this is just, wait a minute, there's something wrong here. You know, this is, I should be talking to this guy. And so, bird flocking, so look at this picture, I mean this video. It, this is in England. Uh, there are a few places in the world with these hospitals, but not too many. Uh, and so what you have here, it's near Oxford, and you have starlings, the, animal, the birds, uh, starlings. And you have about half a million of them. There's a lot of starlings. And around 7 p.m. or something, they, they, they start this ballet, this dance, and, and nobody really knows for sure what's going on. Why? I mean, they think maybe it's like kids before they go to bed, they have to run around and then just cock out. And so, so after this, they will sleep and, uh, in the trees. 
And um, now you notice something, well, you, you would not notice, but, but people who have observed this have never noticed a collision. This is the birthday paradox unproved. I mean, this is clearly a, a refutation of the birthday paradox. I mean, you believe in the birthday paradox, birthday paradox is, is false. And uh, <laughs> on the other hand, just imagine if these were airplanes and you were actually in one of them. <laughs> I think you would believe in the birthday paradox. I think you would there. So, so now you can see this is like a, a, you know the depending what what hat you're wearing, you're going to interpret this very differently. If you're a physicist, if you do a mechanics, or you do you know it's a fluid mechanics, you might look at gas, you might look at water. I mean, you know, it just depends on. Uh, but my point is, we should look at this as agents. Everybody here is a little agent with certain rules, and, and it's a distributed algorithm. And that's it. And you just want to understand what's going on. So there's a. Uh, so what's also remarkable about bird flocking is that there are three rules that Reynolds gave way way back. Uh, he was doing virtual reality, and when you look at uh, the Pixar movies and so on, and, and you see birds flocking, these are all artificial things like that, and. They've passed the Turing test. They passed the Turing test a long time ago in the following sense. Humans cannot tell the difference. I mean, they will tell you, they will show you real birds flocking and the fake ones, and it's 50%. Per, it's 50 you cannot tell the difference. Whereas that's not true in graphics of, of almost anything else. I mean, if you see an apple, the fruit, you can, tell, you can still tell that it's fake. But, so nobody really knows why that's true. The only three rules why this is so visually so accurate for humans. Maybe it's because we humans don't know anything about birds, and maybe birds would laugh their heads off. If it says that, wait, wait, you think this is us? Are you completely nuts? You know, but maybe we're just blind. But uh, so th this model uh, takes one, only one rule out of three, the most important of the three. So it's even simplified, okay? And uh, so what it does roughly is just take every bird and looks within a certain ball of certain radius and just decides to build this graph like this. Okay, so we have this temporal communication network which will change over time and what happens is that uh, a bird has a velocity and the velocity will be, the vector will be averaged. So now you average the vector and then you move. Okay, so it's not quite, it does not fit the previous framework uh, because the network is not a function I mean, it's a function of time, but, but the state variable is the velocity. And the network is not a function of the velocity. The network is a function of the integral of the velocity, which really means it's really not Marco Markovian in a strong sense. So in some sense, this is more difficult, actually. And, um, uh, but what makes it easier is when you assume that, it's, um, that the graph is undirected. Uh, I show that flocking always converges. And in the past, there were proofs that it converged under assumptions. Assumptions that were, in my view, totally unreasonable. I mean, the assumptions pretty, pretty much assume that if you assume it, it converges, it converges. But uh, uh, I mean, it, the assumption was unverifiable. The assumption would be, let's assume that this graph will be connected infinitely often. But, but how do you know that? I mean, that's the whole point. I mean, that really is the whole point. So you can assume that. It's, uh, uh, so anyway, here's what happens. Uh, I won't wrap this up. So, so they fly, they fly, they fly, they fly, and at some point uh, they merge into flocks, uh, and then they all go into their merry ways, uh, and, and they diverge, and each flock, the graph now is uh, constant, uh, will not, not change. This always happens like that. And the timeline, this is the worst case timeline. So this, all, this is not beyond worst case, it's beyond, beyond, beyond worst case. Uh, it takes a very long time for those things to happen in the worst case, but this is optimal. So now, we're computer scientists, and I think this, we should not of course, birds don't take that time, it's, but that's not the argument. I mean, I think it's, it's even silly to have to address that problem. I mean, of course, it's not true. But I think the point is this, that the approach is to look at these birds as a computer. I mean, they compute numbers, after all. These velocities are numbers, and they just compute numbers. And you want to know what can they compute. And this is the beaver function of that computer. It, this is the biggest number it can compute, and it cannot compute anything bigger than that. But this is not a very common function. Towers of two is, but height of log n, uh-uh, no. And I spent enough time with Ackerman to know that the life in that family, uh, and this is, this is not common. And uh, so, so there are a lot of techniques that go actually into proving this thing. Uh, some, I think, are really uh, 
uh, very intriguing, like the spectral shift. But I don't have time to talk about this because I know I can see I'm running out of time. I'll just just mention one quick thing and some intuition about you got five minutes. Okay. Five minutes about the geometry, uh, and um, so just something about the geometry that I think is kind of neat. I, I can describe in a few minutes. Now here's what happens: any bird. It'd be very nice to say that uh, any given bird, uh, or maybe there's some bird that flies kind of straight all the time. And the, the other might, might be spiraling around, but one maybe will go. But that's not true. Uh, that's just not true. However, here's what is true. Now, suppose that there's a baton. Uh, you see, birds now carry a baton. Uh, there's only one of them. There's just one baton. And, uh, and the bird carries the baton in his beak or something like that. And it can pass the baton to anybody that's within its range. So if I'm flying in the same range as Dan, I can pass the baton to Dan. And then maybe he can pass it on to, this is also non-deterministic. You can pass it on to anybody you want. So I'm, de I'm not defining an, an algorithm. I I'm defining a language in which you can decide what algorithm you want. And the question is to know that, so I can, it can do this or it can do that. Well, never mind. And um, it can do this or it can do that. All right. Now, here's the problem. Here's the question. Well, actually, this is not a question. This is a statement. But So the statement is this. There exists a baton passing protocol that keeps the baton almost straight. So this is really weird. I mean, you have all these birds that just go around like crazy. If they hold this baton, they, the, the birds, if they're smart, they could coordinate in such a way that they pass the baton in a very clever way that ensures that the baton goes almost straight. So not quite straight, but almost straight means there's a, there's a bump on the curvature. So, so the curvature of where the baton can go, you know, is very, very uh, low. So um, it, now this is just geometry, and this is crucial to proving. And the most disappointing thing about all the literature on bird flogging, and this is huge, but I mean, this is really gigantic. There's virtually no geometry, and I find this just appalling that all these physicists and so on, they don't believe in geometry. I mean, so birds are just algebraic objects trading eigenvalues when they go, or they have phase transitions, and they have all these bizarre things, but they never actually live in space, you know? And they, I don't know, I just find that very frightening. But uh, so, anyway, so some parting words, which is this. Uh, so the 20th century, uh, I think most people would agree, was the science of the, the triumph of the sciences of the equation. You, have, you can write on one notebook a set of equations that will describe 99% of what's going on around, which is just astonishing. And, um, and Wigner said, well, this was mentioned earlier, the Wigner uh, thing, uh, by several people, actually. But um, well, not directly, but they were. Uh, 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 variant of that, the unreasonable effectiveness of mathematics in the physical sciences. So he didn't say that, actually. He should have said that, but he did not. Um, he actually said something else. He said the unreasonable effectiveness of mathematics in the natural sciences. And I disagree with that. Uh, uh, that's just not true. I think, in fact, that if you look at the modern sciences, you know, uh, which concern most of what we're talking about here, be it neuroscience or networks and uh, you know, interactions between agents and just all these messy things which require expressive languages to be able to things. There's not going to be any equation that simply, you know, solve this equation like Schrodinger and pretty much you'll know how this social network is going to evolve or how the brain is going to work. I, I, I don't think it, we need to find the equation and then we'll be set. I don't think anybody believes that. Um, and so maybe it's uh, not the science. So, so people say, well, I think what's happening is now it's the sciences of, of the computer. So there, there'll be mathematics and then there will be lab experiments, and there will be the computer that does the, the, the computation, the numerics, and the simulation. And I don't believe that either. I actually think it will be the sciences of the algorithm, because the new equations, I mean, equations are mini algorithms, and algorithms, algorithms are more expressive equations. It's just a different language. And I think that's the kind of language that we need to understand. So, but we need tools, and that's really what I've been talking about. So again, I want to thank Tim and Luca for this wonderful workshop. Thanks, guys.
I'm good. <laughs> so I'm thinking, with the of this workshop, you need something else in your model for this flock. So I'm imagining birds watching us thinking, my God, these humans move in their cars in straight lines, and they all suddenly take these right turns. How do they figure out when to do that? Because maybe the birds don't know we're following roads. So conversely, like, yeah. look for roads the birds are following. Yes. No, 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 I mean, is there... so I think if I understand what you're saying, yeah. is, you know, we're asking, how do we model the data? But here I'm asking, how do we model the algorithm? Yeah. I mean, so, so, so uh, the, the reason for bird flocking is because visually it looks good. Okay, maybe. But some other areas, in fact, even visually it does not look good. Mm -hmm. And so the question, I think, if I understand what Dan is saying, is how do we actually find the algorithm that the birds are? And that, that, that to me, is one of the key questions. Well, I don't know yeah. about the powers of two in conversion. Like, yes. you know, maybe if they're following, you know, for all I know, the wind corresponds to roads or something. And that's yes. Why they are. yes, yes, and but the um, again, I mean the 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 power of two. I mean, I, I think w one thing that, that why you know this worst case approach. I mean, somebody I think mentioned it that that's very true. When you solve a problem, first you have to solve the easiest question first. You don't start with the hardest question. You start, and worst case, worst case often is the easiest question. And the reason you have to answer it is because it builds an understanding. And then you can go in with the more complex things. So this silly power of two and so on of its own is useless. It's true. But, but then, maybe now we have more tools and we can build and build more. But the question of getting the algorithm right, I think, is, is really fundamental. And, but I think some of the ideas that we heard from Kevin and others about how we can maybe use machine learning to actually come up with the right algorithm that's not as simplistic as that and uh, might be something uh, useful. And uh, I mean, I'm very lucky that at Princeton, the people who work in biology on, on birds are very friendly. And, and actually, uh, 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 the physicists are not always like that, but the, they are, <laughs> it, it's very pleasant. But sometimes there are cultural difficulties. I mean, I, I'm sure that you, you've seen it. There's some cultural difficulties where maybe we don't speak the same language. And, Interests are different with people you know, across the road, and so. Uh, but I think yes, it's really worth uh, exploring. Questions? Yeah. Uh, I think you mentioned that you know, is there anything beyond this like Pixar test that? Uh, so I mean, one one very nice thing about this model is that humans, you said humans really can't tell the difference. Even this very simple model without roads in the air. Or anything, yes. But is there any like further experimental that's been Yes, so there are, yes, yeah, so um, so in, in the spirit of worst case, and uh, we had this conversation, I don't know if it was dinner or, or something like this, but uh, uh, somebody said, uh, like a uh, biologist who work on these things, what is their metric? And their metric is entirely driven by evolution, and then since evolution, after all, is a very complex thing, it's itself a, a meta principle. I mean, you can have, there's no metric embedded in evolution per se. And then you have to say specifically. And specifically, they say energy. So, in particular, here's what they will do they will say that um, they will measure the energy uh, expended by, like, they've done this for fireflies. I mean, for fruit flies, sorry. So, they have a theorem. These are biologists have a theorem. And the theorem is that the fruit fly has evolved optimally. As, as long as the shape of the wing is not going to change, then maybe the, the shape is a better shape of the wing. But let's say the shape of the wing, condition on having that shape of a wing, it flies perfectly. And so in that sense, they analyze all possible algorithms that they could fly. But, I mean, li literally every possible algorithm that they could use to fly, and then they measure the energy. The criteria is the energy. And firefly, I mean fruit fly, sorry, uh, spend the least amount of energy. Now, some people criticize that and say, well, I think survival, which is evolution, has to do with energy, but has many other criteria that have nothing to do with energy. Uh, you know, what makes you re reproduce more? Right? Energy is important, but there are other factors as well. And, and so there, too, it's not entirely sure that they've got that approach completely right. But at least I think, you know, in, in that sense, they kind of prove Lower bounds, like over all algorithms, you know, this is the optimal way they, they have figured out, and, and that is their entire metric. They classify birds according to on the evolutionary scales. You know, this bird in a million years will be much better, 
and this bird in a million years will be the same. And that's pretty much how they think. Yeah, it completely, it's like us. I mean, I think the P and P, I mean, they really have this hierarchy in that sense. Uh, yeah. 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 So, so, so I, I see you, uh, you know, this argument of the shrinking of quantity of leading to convergence, and your picture shows just, you know, you comment that the bird somehow didn't hit each other. Yeah. And are there any mechanism and theory you can just prove that somehow in this landscape of uh, yeah, uh, yeah, uh, yeah. evolution, not only they didn't uh, they stabilize, but also. So. The people who I, I mean, I personally, there's a whole department basically that works on these things. And, and so I, I asked them, I said, could you build, the, the, uh, there's an airspace um, uh, engineering uh, department, and could you build tort models that could do that? And they just laughed. They said, there's actually no way we could build, in fact, we don't even have the, the motor technology or the materials to do anything without crashing. But actually, so they get money from the Air Force, in fact to study this. And something else I did not mention, which is also heavily studied, are these, these organic theoretic things. So I, I think this is really directly relevant to machine learning, which is these evade pursuit games. So these are two different species of birds, one is trying to eat the other, and they're just flying, and just two, like two, you can imagine two jet fighters just trying to, but, um, and now there's learning going on, because the one being, you know, evading, being chased, has to make a prediction as to what the, where the other one is going to go, and vice versa. So they actually want to understand the game theory going on between these two guys. Uh, and so, again, they accomplish things which, from an engineering point of view, are irreproducible. Uh, I mean, this is just, we, just, we have no clue how we could actually build things where you do that. So, again, if you have a million years to evolve with a trillion agents, you have a leg up on the competition. Uh, that's really, you know, it's... Uh, but even with these, uh, like, simple, the one rule, the simulation you said, which is average of velocities, uh, what are the collisions like in that? What are the uh, collisions? Are there collisions? No, yes, yes. So that's why, like, for the, like, the Pixar people, uh -huh. so one of these three rules is a potential that goes to infinity. If I get too close to, uh, to there, this potential will simply Right, so we'll, 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 yeah, something happens because otherwise they would have collisions. Yeah, so, yeah. And um, but again, to, to go back to the algorithmic aspect of it. So the question is, you know, not only how do we find these these algorithms, but also where are they in the bird? I mean, birds don't go to find school; they just know how to do this thing. And so it must be somewhere. I mean, they have atoms, and it's it's somewhere in there. I mean, let's face it. And so so where so. I, there's been interesting research done on migration, uh, birds migrating. And now they know for a fact that part of the migration planning, uh, so, so say you have birds that fly from northern Germany to Africa, and they fly to the same forest. In fact, they land on the same tree in Africa. And what can happen is, so they go as a family, but here's what could happen, is that you take one chick, one baby bird, away from the family, and then you clone it with some other bird of a different species, and then you take their chip, and that chip will go to Africa. So clearly, clearly something about a map from Germany to Africa is in the DNA at some point, somewhere, something. And how much is encoded, how is it encoded? But there you have the evidence that how the other birds would never go to, so there's a control, of course. You try the non, you know, the, the random bird. And, 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 and you say, hey, go to Africa. So, yeah, it's, it's a random walk. And so, so that to me is even more fascinating because what, they encode a map of the coastline and, and, and they pass that on to the children. And I just find this, I don't know anything. But this, to me, from an algorithmic standpoint, this is fascinating because just imagine for a second if you could find the encoding of a map. The whole uh, GIS, you know, geographical uh, uh, navigation, uh, yeah. and the, the, the brain is very small. I mean, the spread of the brain is really tiny. So, quality maybe is not much somehow. Anyway, I would like to thank uh, all the speakers.